Mrs. Katsavis, you were Minister of Labour when the Troika demanded structural reforms of the labour market. Uh, what did the creditors want you and the government to do in labour markets? Well, I assumed the ministry in early September 2010 after uh, almost a year of my being a Minister of Economy, Competitiveness and Shipping. So I had dealings with Troika before and I had uh, uh, pushed and uh, had discussed with them structural reforms under a different uh, mm -hmm. uh, heading. When I came to the Labour Ministry, it was evident that they had already negotiated and agreed a set of measures with my predecessor to actually dismantle uh, collective agreements and promote flexibility uh, of the labor markets without any security. Mm -hmm. uh, the measures agreed already in August 2010, three months after the original standby agreement, uh, were clearly uh, pushing in that direction. So almost a week after I had assumed office, I had my first discussions with the Troika, and I told them that the changes that were already uh, in the process uh, in terms of the mediation and arbitration law or the uh, dismantling of collective agreements were not really acceptable, but that we could start the discussion and have a dialogue as to what might be um, a new regulatory framework for labor relations that would be supported by social partners, because for me it was important to have the support of social partners and would ensure competitiveness and flexibility in the labor markets, but with security and the support of uh, workers as much as possible. You said they wanted the complete dismantling of all collective agreements? Uh, we had, this was the, I, I think it's clear that this was the end uh, objective. But that's, that's, uh, that's the, uh, an attack on all trade union unfortun activism. Unfortunately, it is an attack not only on trade union activism, and we have seen that, but also on the capacity of social uh, partners to come together and discuss and agree. And uh, what we've seen since then is exactly this, an abolition of social dialogue against international conventions against the ILO, uh, the International, Labor, International Organization. Labor Organization, against uh, what we consider a European social model and against, of course, what is going on in Germany and other countries. What is the rationale behind these measures? Well, the rationale was and still is a very neoliberal perspective that any kind of collective agreement or any kind of uh, uh, regulatory framework uh, works against the competitiveness of firms so that if, for example, we let wages fall as much as possible uh, or if we don't uh, allow uh, sectoral or occupational agreements to regulate uh, wage and labor conditions, then uh, somehow uh, profits uh, would rise, investment will come about, and unemployment will be mitigated. Of course, this is a myth. It has never happened. And one of the early discussions we've had with the Troika was uh, exactly my warning that if you impose uh, across the board in an economy such as the Greek one, uh, the dismantling of collective agreements and wages drop by 30 and 40 percent as they were expected to drop, this would deepen the recession even further because purchasing power would just be squeezed even more. And what did they answer? Well, it uh, sounds a plausible argument. Uh, well, this was an <laughs> ongoing discussion, especially with Mr. Thompson, uh, that the representative he was convinced of the, IMF. the representative of the IMF. Uh, he was convinced that somehow profit generation would be uh, an enabler and a sufficient driver for growth to resume in Greece uh, without considering at all uh, all the other impediments 
uh, structural impediments that I think are still extremely important and they are binding constraints in uh, the resumption of growth in our country. Mm -hmm. And how did they react when you did not agree? Well, uh, I still remember uh, the first uh, meeting we had where after an exchange of arguments uh, pro and against the, my proposal to institute for the first time in Greece a firm level collective agreement. Uh, firm level in opposite to, to, sectoral to sectoral level. level. In a way, what we, up, to, up to that point we had in Greece only, uh, we had enterprise agreements but they were dominated by sectoral agreements and occupational agreements across different firms. And I realized, and uh, I still think it was uh, the correct argument, that under the present conditions in Greece, there, there might be firms which might need to deviate from that sectoral agreement because they had problems uh, in, in uh, international markets. In European Germany, markets, this is usual since many years. Exactly. So that they needed some flexibility and a regulatory framework to be able to deviate from sectoral agreements, but under some conditions. And the conditions I had proposed. Uh, following the suggestions of the social partners themselves, including the industrial uh, partners and the small-scale enterprise uh, representatives and so on, is first of all that the workers should be part of that agreement so that we still maintain a collective agreement and it's not a unilateral action on the part of the employer. And secondly, that if there is a need for such a deviation, this should be made apparent and transparent and should be a, a report in the General uh, Labour Inspectorate justifying uh, the one or two or three reasons why such deviation is essential. Mm -hmm. These were the only prerequisites. The Troika found these even uh, um, not suitable uh, and uh, too binding for employers. And basically they, they wanted, it was cleared for employers to have completely the upper hand and without any dialogue or without any agreement on the part of workers to be able to set the, the, the wage. Now the interesting thing is that uh, later on they went even further uh, after I had left uh, the government. Uh, they went even further and they said it's not enough, we want the government to be able to impose the, the uh, terms of uh, both for the minimum wage and for wage settlements. So that we've gone even further than this, it's not even the social partners who decide among themselves, but uh, the government has now every right to uh, impose is, conditions. But that is a new of form of a central planning economy. <laughs> I'm afraid that uh, the extreme neoliberal positions that are now prevailing uh, appear more and more uh, to be uh, kind of central planning ideas. And where the, Which the is government the is the complete opposite of a free market. A, it's a complete opposite. It's not because look, uh, it's it's complete opposite to what you, the European social model uh, used to be, mm -hmm. where you need a consent among social partners. And it's it's interesting that when I hear and follow the discussions in Germany about the minimum wage in Germany and so on, it's exactly the opposite. Um, not only do we want uh, unions not to have any voice, but we don't even have we don't even want uh, associations of industrialists or SMEs to have any voice in, around the bargaining mm -hmm. table. It's only the governments which are being kind of pushed. I'm afraid by uh, some uh, political leaders uh, outside uh, the country or by banking interests. And did you ever discuss with the representative of the EU Commission? which is obligated to, f to, 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 to pre prevent a, a, the, an abolition of, of the European uh, social model. Did you ever discuss with him or her about what they are doing in this Troika process in Greece? But as you know, the Troika, in the Troika, you have a representative, a high-level representative of the EU Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, in my time, I was uh, dealing uh, with uh, Servan uh, de Ros. De Ros. Uh, Mr. Morse succeeded him. Uh, they were both, uh, I'm afraid, uh, following exactly the same uh, position. And uh, I had uh, an even written uh, uh, kind of uh, correspondence uh, with Mr. De Roos precisely 
on the uh, need to preserve uh, kind of collective agreements to preserve the social dialogue and and in that kind of confrontation we had I even submitted in writing the support of all social partners for the proposal that we submitted and it is against that uh, agreement that uh, the Troika pushed for complete change of labor laws. So they assumed that even the employers do not know what is what good. What their interest is. What, what their interest exactly. is and what, what is good for them. Well, that's exactly what that has happened. And this is the reason that now social dialogue in Greece is dead. Mm -hmm. And social and how this how this law you 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 describing, how it has been created, this new law? Well, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I assumed the ministry in September to 2010, as we said. Uh, we had negotiations between September 2010 up to December 17, 2010, when I presented the bill in Parliament. We had reached agreement on a number of provisions, but not all of them. Uh, I decided uh, to go ahead and present it in Parliament. It was, even pushing it through Parliament was a very difficult uh, thing at that time because already you had opposition. But still, uh, I felt I could defend it and that at a time of crisis you need some flexibility. Uh, but I would not, was not ready to go further than, uh, than uh, what was already in the law. Mm -hmm. Well, immediately afterwards, the, after December, the Troika again intervened, saying that the law that was passed did not meet the MOU requirements and that uh, uh, they were not willing to accept it. Can we, film, can we see them? Can we film them or are you... Why not? Why not? This one. Why not? What the heck? <laughs> What he, can they do? He's, he's not even in office anymore, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. De Rose. <laughs> huh? That's why we'll never become it? central bank governor. <laughs> That's the cost. <laughs> Dear Minister, we have a serious problem. Text is not acceptable. <laughs> Key, indispensable provisions are absent. And very much comments, proposals have been ignored in some inconsistence with MOU on many accounts. Uh, so we had a bit of a political uh, impasse. impasse. And uh, then the Minister of Finance intervened uh, politically, I presume with the blessing of the Prime Minister actually arguing that uh, this was as far as we could go and that we would follow the implementation of the law and see if uh, changes need to be made in due time. Well, the law started being implemented between January and May uh, of 2011. Uh, in my view, the implementation went okay, was all right. Uh, we had already 13 firm level sectoral agreements. Uh, and. Uh, and the situation was being normalized. In May, when they came for the next uh, review, for the next re next review, they did not raise the issue of implementation. But two days before they issued their report, I was called by the Minister of Finance, who told me that uh, they, the Troika is putting as a prior action the rep uh, change of the law. What does it mean, prior action? Uh, uh, namely, that we would not. Uh, if you don't do what we tell you to do, we were not going to give you the extra amount of uh, the, the, the next tranche, the next of, the tranche of, the, of the of the Credit. amount uh, due. So uh, this is a blackmail in a way, saying that either you do whatever we tell you to do, or we don't pay, we don't give a tranche. This is a conditionality, but in a conditionality which is so enhanced and so severe that I've never seen it in my professional life and I've seen many standby agreements in many developing countries including Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, I negotiated a couple of standby agreements and I've never seen terms such as the one. And they circumvented you as a responsible so, minister so and went directly well, through the they, finance ministry? They always went directly through the finance minister who was the chief negotiator with the Troika. Uh, I think even that was a mistake. And this was a mistake of the Greek government from the beginning because it was only, and it continues to be, there is only a finance minister who is the key 
point, uh, point of contact with the Troika and he's the official negotiator with his own team. Uh, there is no team as such which is negotiating. And a second uh, terrible mistake in my view is that we, rather than speaking at the political level, there are, uh, the Troika consists of uh, high level officials of the three organizations uh, who should be talking at the technical level with mm -hmm. uh, Greek uh, representatives and not at the political level. So there was a lack of political legitimization uh, which we can discuss. So, uh, when in May, in May the, uh, this request was put forward and uh, for the law to change, I, I said I cannot sign such a change. The implementation continues. And we the change been, would have been, to, in essence? The change would have been the complete going, back, going back to their original demands, namely dismantling the, the, collective, uh, the collective agreements and having a uh, kind of uh, complete flexibility in terms of wage uh, uh, formation. But wouldn't it have, this have meant also that there is no further purpose for, for trade unions? No well, well, but, uh, because what, what do trade unions need if, uh, do when they do not collectively ban And bargaining? not only trade unions, but all social partners. Yes. And this is, I think, the reason why industrialists uh, uh, commerce representatives and so on understood that from the beginning that their own role was completely uh, was not needed and that's why they supported me uh, throughout this process and they supported the the preservation of social dialogue and of collective agreements otherwise they had no raison d'être mm -hmm. uh, so um, well to make a long story short I did not sign I did not agree to their requests. Uh, it was two days before the signing of the report, so they said okay. The review. The, the, the review. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was an intervention, I'm sure, by the Prime Minister. Uh, they did not want a governmental crisis at that point, so the point was not raised. But uh, two weeks later, there was a reshuffling of the government and I was removed uh, from the ministry. Uh, ten days later, uh, my understanding is that the Minister of Finance called on to the Secretary General of the Ministry of Labour and asked them to start preparing a cha changes in the law. Uh, changes in the law came to Greek Parliament in November of 2011. Uh, it was a clear, um, a clear kind of uh, regime switch, let me put it this way, where all labor relations were changed, complete liberalization of uh, labor relations, a dismantling of social dialogue collective mm -hmm. agreements. Uh, and uh, I voted against, I was the only parliament member who voted against it. It was the article 37 of that uh, law. Uh, it was two weeks, no, it was a few weeks before the referendum and the mm -hmm. whole can agreement. I voted against it and I was expelled from the PASOK uh, uh, parliamentary group as a result. Mm -hmm. um, so at that, when I spoke in parliament, I told them, look, the next step is the dismantling of the minimum wage. Ah, you already knew that? I, no, I, could, I, I knew it. Mm -hmm. I knew it would come. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was uh, exposed, uh, it's interesting to go back to that discussion in Parliament, to see my colleagues in Parliament, even my own party, saying that no, this is a red line, it would never happen, well, it happened a few months later. And uh, oh, even, in, even in December 2011? This was, the second memorandum was voted uh, where the, the changes in the minimum mm -hmm. law were introduced were in February mm -hmm. of the next year, of 2012. And uh, so uh, it was clear, the second uh, thing which I mentioned at that speech is that, uh, look, uh, we will have a much deeper recession than the one, uh, than the one uh, uh, estimated, primarily because of this uh, action. That when in a country, uh, at the time of a crisis, not only you cut fiscal expenditures by the percentage that you did, but at the same time, you let all wages drop uh, by 20 and 30 percent uh, across the economy. 
without any flaw, uh, this will uh, have dramatic effects on uh, unemployment and on purchasing power. And unfortunately, uh, I wish I was not uh, right. Mm -hmm. When you dealt with the Troika, how, how did these officials, as you call them, or as I say technocrats, how did they deal with you as an elected man minister? Uh, that's a different... I, I, I have to say that because I always um, talk to them uh, base, basing my, my positions on arguments, and technical arguments, and I was, uh, being a professional economist, I could carry the argument. And play in uh, their league. Yeah, they were, they were always serious and we had an interesting discussion. On the other hand, in, many, in a lot of the correspondence that we had, I think the tone of the correspondence was not suitable. For example, if anything, uh, for example, they would uh, we would receive letters and have many of them, which would say this is unacceptable, uh, it has to be changed, uh, or drafting and redrafting of laws or or uh, articles of a law that we would send to them to check. And I'm sure they had legal offices uh, which uh, helped them redraft, both in Greek and in English, mm -hmm. the law and the text that was sent to them. So they themselves were drafting laws? Oh, absolutely. And they continued to do so. So they, they played the legislator? Well, I think it's... Look, the, the Greek government uh, progressively uh, lost its capacity to govern. The, the country, uh, till, I would say probably till now, uh, even though I'm not in government and I don't have a first-hand experience, mm -hmm. is being governed uh, by the Troika. But allow me to show you uh, here. <laughs> if you can see, uh, they would send a draft uh, uh, article and they would s scratch it out and put a new text. Uh -huh. And then we would have to go back and forth. Uh, so the they were not just commenting on no, drafts from your ministry. Drafts they, they, redrafts. they draft, redrafts, and, and redrafts. As Even the last word. Look here, completely lined out and redrafted. And then we would go. We would have as if we are in a, we were at the UN, redrafting a joint resolution. <laughs> <laughs> Except that we were elected officials and they were bureaucrats and technocrats. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, this is probably the biggest mistake that was done. Why that? Well, because that completely, apart from the democratic legitimacy of the whole process, mm -hmm. I think that completely um, undermined the ownership of the reform process for the mm -hmm. Greek government and the Greek uh, administrative uh, cadre. Uh, when uh, there is no ownership of a, of a reform, of a needed reform, because I'm, uh, uh, I'm a person who thinks that the Greek government, the Greek uh, economy needs reforms and that uh, there are a lot of things that need to be changed in this country, both mm -hmm. regulatory reform, labor market reforms, uh, industrial reforms and so on, so that we can enhance our productive capacity. But the way you manage reforms, the way you do reforms, matter a lot. So if people don't feel that they have the ownership of that reform, but that there is a bunch of uh, technocrats from abroad who come and say, that's what you're going to do, mm -hmm. uh, this uh, in a way runs against the, the, the willingness and the potential for reforms. And one of the reasons why reforms have stalled in Greece is that, first of all, they were wrong reforms in many, mm -hmm. in many instances, and secondly, that they were promoted in a completely wrong manner. And this is, I think, one of the problems with even with the IMF evaluation of the uh, program in Greece, that they never, even though they've talked about the multipliers and why the multipliers, uh, there were oh. errors in the multipliers, they never addressed the fundamental question that the package was wrong. Not only the macro policy package, but also the structural reform package. And the way structural reforms were promoted and pushed through 
uh, were counter uh, productive. Uh, probably they will they will excuse themselves by well what could we do there was so much resistance from the Greek side and uh, they did not move and we had to overcome this resistance because otherwise nothing would have happened that's that's for example how Mr. Schäuble would have explained well, this. Well I wish there was a resistance uh, I'm afraid there was paralysis. Uh, if there was resistance then you have arguments and counter arguments. Uh, there was resistance in the in both Ministry of Economy and the Ministry of Labour when mm -hmm. under my leadership. Uh, but when there is resistance, there is a potential of a synthesis, mm -hmm. which is suitable and acceptable. Mm -hmm. And uh, my feeling is that if the same stance was followed across, and if this was uh, also uh, disseminated more widely, and if we had uh, presented our own mm -hmm. uh, plan for restructuring reforms and fiscal consolidation as opposed to kind of uh, accepting passively whatever creditors uh, imposed and demanded, then Greece would have been in a much better position today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you ever see a chance to, to do it in another way? When, when this chance existed? Only in the very beginning? What do you mean to do it? To do it in a better way, to do reforms without this pressure. Have there any, any, well, at any time been a, a window of opportunity? I think there were windows of opportunities throughout. Even in November 2011, when uh, I was alone in Parliament, as I told you, and mm -hmm, voted yes. against it, even then there was a, a tremendous window of opportunity because I'm sure that nobody in Europe would have um, consented to uh, uh, labor market reforms which were undesirable on the part of social partners. So when I asked Mr. Papandreou, I said, look, uh, we had a private conversation mm -hmm. uh, during that tumultuous meeting of parliament, and I said, look, you should ask other parliament members to vote against it because I think we have every legitimate uh, reason to tell uh, Europeans that this is something to let the social dialogue work, to, to uh, put forward um, changes that mm -hmm. have the support of social partners as opposed to only the, the consent of the Troika. Um, he, he, the, the, there was paralysis. He was not... Uh, he did not want to move and uh, many of the ministers and in different ministries uh, unfortunately had the same uh, uh, the same uh, attitude uh, in the negotiations of the troika and this permeated the government the troikans always write in their reviews of vested interests that had to be overcome or that were the reason why structural reforms were not properly implemented uh, do you know what they mean by this vested interest? Uh, first of all, sure there are vested interests. If in, a, in any uh, society there is. I'm afraid that vested interest, interests colluded with the Troika <laughs> to push exactly the reforms that they wanted. What kind of vested interest well, do you think, for example? Uh, for example, the, some parts of the financial sector uh, were very uneasy about uh, the transparency that uh, wanted uh, that was required for from the firm level collective agreement so I'm sure that uh, they were uh, they were a pressure group to dismantle that law mm -hmm. uh, there is there is a lot of evidence that this happened uh, there are some uh, problematic uh, large uh, labor intensive firms which uh, did not uh, want to, they wanted the, the kind of wages to, to drop and uh, were very much, very well served by the, um, by the Troika's position. But which were allow at the same wages. time member of the Employers Association. Uh, were represented by the Employers Association, but the Employers Association uh, had necessarily to take a much more collective view of the process mm -hmm. and um, I had a very very good uh, rapport and uh, there was consensus building 
uh, with social mm -hmm. partners and re their representatives. And uh, till the end of my stay in the ministry, I have to say that, uh, that they supported, uh, we had a common platform. Mm -hmm. Later on, when you already have left the ministry, it has happened as you has predicted, uh, you had predicted the minimum wage was also lowered That's against right. the will of the social partners. Um, how did your, your colleagues in Parliament react to when, when, your, when your forecast uh, was fulfilled? I'm afraid they voted for the, the same people who were saying that this would not happen and this was a red line for them and they would not fall back. They all succumbed and voted in favour. No, but, was was, but was it voted at all? Sure. It, it was, no, it it was, was declared voted. by a government decree? No, it was voted. It was part of the second memorandum of agreement in February 2012. Ah. Uh, but it was not a special law? Because the, special the minimum, was, minimum wage is a law, right? No, but, but this was the, 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 the guidelines were incorporated into mm -hmm. the second memorandum and then the different uh, legislative uh, measures were taken. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the Thucydides, uh, many, many years ago, said uh, something which I've seen it in practice now, that uh, uh, the, the powerful uh, kind of push you as much as their power allows you, and the weak kind of withdraw mm -hmm. uh, to the point where their weakness uh, leads them. And I'm afraid that uh, throughout this experience the thing that struck me more is how easy people whom you thought would stand up were mm -hmm. able to give in. And one of the reasons, and now when you talk and I talk to officials, EU officials or IMF officials, they are the ones who argue openly that uh, why do you say that? The Greek government did not negotiate mm -hmm. with us. And, uh, and it's really this paralysis that, and this uh, submission that I find inexcusable. Mm -hmm. Since you are a very knowledgeable person and an economist and uh, you have dealt with the banks, may I ask you some questions on the, on the bank uh, sure, recap thing? Because this is one important issue for the film, that on the one hand there's spent so much money on banks and on the other hand there's lack of money in all the other necessary uh, fields. Um, as far as I've understood, the Greek government has already spent around 40 billion euros for the recapitalization of of the four pillar banks, borrowed money from the European security, uh, financial stability. stability mechanism, and at the same time, the Troika imposed, or the Eurogroup imposed, that these banks, which are de facto nationalized now, are being reprivatized in a relatively short period of time, in three years only, and um, by this, the government is going to, to lose a lot of money which were invested in these banks. Um, what is the, the logic behind this process? Well, why this happens? The, Americans, the American government made a profit with uh, making their banks healthy again. The way the recapitalization process is going on means that not only the Greek government but also European taxpayers are losing a lot. And there is a massive transfer from the European taxpayer to the European financial system, including the Greek banks and their owners. Uh, this happened consistently. It happened in the beginning. The reason why the issue of the restructuring of debt was not put in the political agenda was because German banks were up to their ears with Greek bonds. And if a restructuring and a haircut was imposed at the beginning, it would have meant that they would have lost a lot of money. Mrs. Merkel and Mr. Schäuble and uh, the European leadership were not ready to uh, see this happen. Mm -hmm. So the discussion was not of the Greek, of a restructuring of the Greek debt was not uh, touched upon and it was touched upon only two years later after German banks and other European multinational banks were able to divest 130 billion worth of Greek, Greek bonds. bonds. Mm -hmm. 
And the same happened in other countries as well. Secondly, we went through the PSI, and with which, the PSI, which was a with debt a, relief, with, no? with a, de a haircut yeah. and a haircut, with complete. The, the amazing thing to me is that this happened with almost complete, with almost complete offset of losses to the banking sector through the recapitalization process, but with zero, zero redemption of losses for individual persons who or legal public legal entities who were also submitted to a 50% haircut overnight because they were holding Greek bonds. Mm -hmm. So Greek individuals, individuals who were holding Greek bonds were saw their property and their assets cut by half overnight. Universities, hospitals, uh, chambers of commerce, public entities also lost half of their assets in one night. Well, the Only banks The were responsible decision makers, are, when, when you put the quest, this question to them, they say, okay, this is a pity, but the, the four main banks we needed to recapitalize because without banks there is no economy and without the economy the, working, uh, the suffering of the Greek people would be much the, harder and that's the reason why we had to, to spend right. 40 billion for the recapitalization. But this is the most simplistic argument that only fools can accept. Because banks are definitely needed. Banks fulfill a very important intermediation role, there is no doubt about it. But how banks function, and if banks can, can produce outcomes for the benefit of the real economy, mm -hmm. has to do with the way banks are regulated and the way banks perform. Now, in the case of the European financial crisis, banks and financial capital in a way captured the political process, uh, kind of pushed through uh, a series of, of measures that uh, benefits owners of banks mm -hmm. and uh, kind of high-level staff of banks, to the detriment of the real economy and now so many years after the crisis we still don't have liquidity channeled to the real economy we have small scale and larger scale and uh, viable firms craving for liquidity and we are pumping more and more and more money to banks which are going to use it to cover their own liabilities with no with absolutely no guarantee that we put a framework in place or a mechanism in place to channel this needed liquidity into the real market. And there is no provisions. You asked me, we started the discussion about the, the recapitalization. Well, even when banks became public for a short period of time before their privatization, there were absolutely no mechanism put in place to safeguard that the real economy is being uh, financed. But my question went even a step further. Because of the forced reprivatization in only three years, yeah. the government is going to lose is, money, is going to lose money with a very, very Absolutely. expensive investment. And, and at the same time, hospitals do not have enough money to buy disinfectants and antibiotics. Exactly. It's a reverse transfer. It's a reverse transfer from government, wage earners, pensioners, taxpayers to the banks and the, the, the privatization and to few. So the, and this is not only in Greece, it's everywhere in Europe. You see, uh, even the way the banking union is being uh, promoted will lead to the same results. Uh, you see a transfer of resources to the banks with no supervision uh, whatsoever uh, and, and a privatization process of the bank that will make some people extremely rich to the detriment of the many. And for example, we saw that... And we part, passed a law. Did part, you know that part, we passed a law part saying of, that... Part of the shares of these state-owned banks, yeah. nationalized banks, part of the shares have been sold at, an, at a bargain price to American hedge funds or Absolutely. international investment funds who now make a killing 
um, with trading in these shares um, on the basis of, a, of an artificially created bubble. bubble. With bubble exactly. Yeah? And at the same time, everyone comes up, but look, everybody, all the rumors and the credit rating agencies and so on saying prospects uh, are very good for the Greek economy, so they are creating a bubble. It's like the stock market crash uh, in 2000. They are creating an environment that somehow Greece is now out of the crisis, uh, that all the signs are good, uh, so prices are going up, they have bought it at very low prices and they're going to make a killing. You have a, a new form of a speculative uh, bubble. Uh, but this, but this is extremely short-sighted. In, in, in one or Absolutely. two years' time, and you know it will, will turn happen. out it that will, but, but that's it's worthless but, and, and the banks will, 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 will collapse again. And not only that, I will tell you that this will happen no matter what. Uh, because the, as you squeeze and squeeze all of the middle class and the lower income groups, they are unable to pay debts. Already the red loans, the, the non -performing. loans, non non-performing loans, are, have reached 30 to 40 percent. So the more uh, this uh, is allowed to go on and they cannot pay loans to the banks or even taxes or whatever, uh, sooner or later, we will need a new recapitalization. But then no and, money will be and left. Then, and, but then no money will be left. So, so it's, it's, I'm afraid I will be a little bit harsh. It's looting. It's, it's actually, uh, unfortunately, a small uh, group is looting the country. And the same thing, I'm afraid, happens with the privatization process that uh, all of the asset prices have been allowed to fall uh, tremendously and now uh, different uh, hedge funds and uh, uh, real estate uh, companies and so on come in to buy these things at very, very uh, little money to be able to sell it uh, in a very short time and make huge profits. Yes, here, here in Athens, no, there's there's Absolutely. the former uh, airport area, Absolutely. the Elenikon airport area, with which has been sold at less than half the value estimated a year before. Huh? Yes, and there was only there's, one bidder. There's only one bidder. But it is a privatization process exactly. process where there's only one bidder. Usually, if you have only one bidder, you would interrupt the process and say, okay, we sell it two years later. But uh, not in Greece, under the Troika. In Greece, under the Troika, uh, the government allows it to go on and uh, the buyer, of course, uh, will reap tremendous profits. And that's why I'm saying that, the, that this process delegitimizes, has severe implications for the political process and for democracy. Because when you see such looting taking place, uh, then I'm not surprised that Golden Dawn and, and fascist groups uh, come up. Uh, what do you recommend, for example, German or French citizens, how to behave in this situation? Well, what, what, what we can do? Well, first of all, they need to realize that what's happening in Greece is not a Greek... It's not because of Greece or it's not uh, only uh, kind of uh, limited to Greece. Uh, I'm afraid that this is a paradigm, uh, an attempt by primarily financial interests and, uh, and uh, kind of a small uh, elite to push through a European agenda which would have severe implications for Europe uh, in my view, will destroy Europe as we knew it. Uh, and the results of the Euro elections, uh, I think, made clear the, the lack of legitimacy that European institutions uh, right now uh, have in the eyes of the average uh, European citizen. Uh, so, uh, first of all, they, therefore, they need to realize that this can come to them that this is not an isolated uh, event. Uh, secondly, uh, I think they need to understand that it's against their own interests. That uh, Greece, which is crippled, 
and uh, Europe which is segmented uh, is not good for German uh, citizens or for German uh, business people, etc., etc. Europe is not going to gain the competitiveness gain by uh, marginalizing its people, but by investing in innovation, in productivity, having a productivity enhancing growth, and uh, productive restructuring. And we need the know-how of Germany, we need the skills and the, of countries, of industrial countries and of leading countries such as Germany and France to be put to the, uh, if you want, to uh, uh, future Europe, which is providing jobs and better opportunities for its citizens, not a Europe which is uh, marginalizing its people, especially its young generations. Mm -hmm. Well, many Germans think, I'm sorry to say that, but many Germans think the Greeks shall stop complaining. They have done it wrong. We have lent them a lot of money uh, to, to, to avoid their bankruptcy and now they shall start working. You know, that's, the, that's what ordinary people talk in, 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 in Germany. What do you tell them? Well, I think uh, there's no doubt that uh, Greece has had has had many uh, wrong policies in the past, uh, but uh, for, allow me to say that Greeks are working very hard. Actually, they are working even harder than German, <laughs> this is many a times, uh, according to official uh, figures. We are different, uh, uh, and uh, there is a, a, a lot of the, of the problems in Greece, including corruption, including expenditures uh, that were unwarranted and so on, benefited Germany. Uh, let's not forget that uh, the biggest uh, scandal in Greece was a Siemens scandal. Let's not forget that uh, in the telecommunications business uh, there were a lot of shabby business. Uh, let's not forget that the procurement in the army procurement uh, was, uh, it, it needed two to tango and unfortunately uh, large uh, German uh, firms were uh, very much involved. And so uh, I think as Europeans and as colleagues in a larger Europe, we need to work together uh, and we need to, to face and be very honest with each other to see where asymmetric, where, where we can correct asymmetries. You cannot have within a unified euro, under a eurozone, a country which has large surpluses and sustained macro surpluses and other countries sustained macro deficits without any uh, attempt to manage these imbalances across a unified eurozone. We will have crisis coming up. We cannot have a eurozone unless we deal effectively with tax evasion and with the tax havens. We cannot have a eurozone together unless we tackle the banking regulation. Unless we change the European Central Bank so that it can lend directly and it can intervene effectively in secondary markets to uh, protect the eurozone from speculative attacks. We need to have a European agenda for innovation and growth. We need to have uh, provisions for our young to be able to move across our countries. We need to have a common migration policy. So there is a whole agenda that I think ties us together. And uh, the worst thing we can do for Europe is to allow this segmentation and this uh, these policies to continue because these are policies which divide us and not unite us. Okay, thank you very much. You're